Hi, I'm your host, Vasco Duarte. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, where we share tips and tricks from Scrum Masters around the world. Every day, we bring you inspiring answers to important questions that all Scrum Masters face day after day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday this week with Chris Stone. Hi, Chris. Welcome back. Hi there again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So on Tuesdays, we dive into the reasons why sometimes the teams implode, they self-destruct. But before we go there, we do want to know, what was the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master, Chris? Okay, Vasco. So I think the, this may be the, the primacy recency effect talking, but I think the, the most influential book for me is probably Turn the Ship Around by David Marquet. Are you familiar with this one? Absolutely. Yeah. So for those that aren't, it's uh, the story of how a submarine captain in the U.S. Navy took what was essentially an underperforming ship, a vessel, in one of the most rigid command and control environments there are in the U.S. Navy and turned that ship into one of the highest performing vessels within a year through embracing a leader-leader mindset. So rather than the, the typical, more common leader-follower model where someone at the top of a company of, of, of the hierarchy uh, instructs people to do things and everyone follows, uh, Leader Leader encourages autonomy, which aligns hugely for me with autonomy, mastery and purpose uh, mindsets, which are covered in Dan, Pook's Bink, uh, Dan Pink's book, Drive. Uh, so between David Marquet's book, Turn the Ship Around, and this one, they, for me, embody everything I intend to foster with those I work it with in teams being agile. So I listen to Turn the Ship Around on Audible as part of a daily habit I have uh, of getting exercise and learning at the same time. And for me, it's it's a great book because it has a number of actionable items, uh, workshop styles you can try, and real-life context through telling the story uh, for how you can try and achieve you know, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, not specifically using those languages, but achieving that outcome with those you work with. Absolutely. It's a great book. Definitely recommend that. So uh, thanks for the recommendation. Uh, Chris, now we turn our attention to uh, what was very clear was one of David Marquet's uh, perspectives, that of fostering the team, right? And we need to understand, in order to help teams grow, we need to understand what are the threats to those very same teams. And uh, that's why on Tuesday, we ask you to tell us a story of a team, tell us a little bit about the context, but walk us through the steps of how a certain pattern or behavior emerged in the team and ultimately led to problems. Tell us that story, Chris. Absolutely. So I'm a big fan of, of telling stories and I'll tell you the tale of a team that I worked with recently. So the situation was they'd been They've been putting a really, again, a bit, a bit like the, the previous example I was referring to with, with yesterday's discussion. They were in a very difficult situation and everyone knew that. It was widely acknowledged. They were given waterfall deadlines and asked to work using agile ways of working. They were tasked with integrating multiple systems together from a legacy system without any expertise or, or knowledge historically. And they basically had to piece things together and learn as they, as they went along. They were up against it constantly, and, and they began with the right intentions. They had, um, they, they began with Agile, they started working with certain practices, maybe a little bit too dogmatically, but as time pressure increased, they they stopped doing retros, they stopped doing, you know, their stand-ups started becoming status meetings. They began self-destructing, and as a consequence, they all felt that frustration and that pressure, and they wanted to change, but they felt they were too busy to change. So it, it wasn't a single habit or behavior in particular that was destructive. It was many things, all of them combining to consolidate a, a frustrating situation from, from them all. And for me, cons if I was to consider them with it with unconditional positive regard, they were they were doing the best they could with the knowledge and skills they had available at the time and the situation at hand. So that that's the that's the situation they were they were in. Um, the way I. I coached this. Uh, the way I came in and tried to tried to assist here was asserting one of my my favorite quotes at the moment, which is taking no action is in itself a decision. So I made them aware that through them choosing not to act, they are essentially accepting that they are too busy to change. And, and this is their reality. And that acknowledging that they're not going to change won't improve their situation so that they were consciously allowing themselves to disrupt to self to self destruct. And, and what I encouraged them to do was just, just, just to start small, right? Think of 
a few experiments that they could attempt in the next few weeks that are focused on improving their current reality, improving their, their current situation. And if they committed to examining um, yeah, and trying a few experiments for a few weeks, and then through a retrospective at the end of that, working out what worked and what didn't, and perhaps tweaking a few things and coming up with new experiments to try, they, they would hopefully start moving their trajectory in the right direction, which is the important thing, their trajectory. Now, the, the honest answer is they, they haven't yet, you know, they haven't fixed their reality yet. They are on the right path, however, their trajectory is improving. And I'm, I'm sure that if they, they keep experimenting and embracing those experiments, that they will get there. So one, one of the things that you mentioned is this pressure of schedule and, you know, always feeling like we're running after the schedule all the time. And, and that can lead to a lot of anti-patterns, some of which you, you just described uh, Another one that you didn't describe, but probably happened to some extent, is that there's the team is then more prone for destructive conflict, right? So instead of accepting that some things go wrong and just moving on, then you know there's pressure, and therefore we start blaming each other. Those are all things that can emerge in a team and and lead to problems. Uh, for me, one of the things that is important when we talk about this question is to understand the symptoms, the things that start kind of creeping in slowly, but are already telling us that something is about to go wrong. So wh when you look at this situation, the team you just described, w what were the symptoms that prompted you as, as an Agile coach and a Scrum Master to start intervening, to start helping the team? What were the, the things that told you, hey, wait, we need to stop this and we need to do something different? So the, the only honest answer is, is that I wasn't the, the coach for them throughout this whole process. I, I was new to the company. Um, they, were, they were a team that had been work, you know, were around for, for that year. So they weren't uh, a very mature team. And the honest answer is I wasn't there to observe some of these symptoms and these habits. What I did was I sat down with those involved and I sought to listen, I you know, empathize, right? Where, where do you currently feel you're struggling today? Um, and that began to uncover you know, their, their view, not mine, their view of where their challenges were. Now, some of the things you mentioned there, absolutely correct. You know, the, the, the delivery pressures were, uh, were causing frustration, which can lead to uh, blaming one another rather than focusing on actions they can take. Um, it was relatively a negative environment. And I think the, if, if I had been there, what I, what I feel I would have observed as symptoms is more more negative language in in the in the sessions they're having. Um, obviously, stopping with experiments, stopping retros, stopping um, doing stand ups in the right way. Uh, so these are some of the observations that I feel I would have seen. But the honest answer is, I wasn't there to see it in person. Absolutely. Uh it's important that we understand what some of those potential hints or tips or or symptoms might be so that we can then intervene uh, and let's start with one thing or let's that's uh, i would i wanted to ask you something very specific we've already talked about it on monday which is this idea that the daily meetings turn into status meetings and and we know that why that is a problem collaboration doesn't emerge that way you know team members are not listening to each other because they think that the status is for someone else etc cetera, etc cetera. there's a lot of uh, anti patterns that emerge when when team members see the daily as a status meeting um, what tips do you have for us chris on on how to turn that around sure so the tips that i would have is first off just observe those sessions understand where where you feel the dysfunction is and then if you know as you as you observe what they are and as you learn alongside speaking to the team and, and learning what they think because i think one of the things that coaches forget to do is to understand what the team thinks themselves. So what I what I prefer to do is understand what the team thinks first before imposing my own potential solutions or my own my own lens, because they may be feeling very differently and I may not understand the situation. So the, I guess the tips are observe in a 360 deg 360 degree way what you're seeing from certain sessions. Listen to the team and understand what they think certain um, problems are and then from there you can begin taking action and if it's for example you've got a certain person treating it like a status meeting have a conversation with them in, in private understand why it is that they may be uh, treating the meeting in that way it could very well be a lack of understanding is the proper 
uh, outcomes behind a stand-up. It could be they've got their own delivery pressures and they feel that's the way that they need to exhibit control and they, they need to treat the situation to try and get results. Um, and then where necessary, if they're open to it, there's obviously the option to provide education to that person. Um, you can also try to emphasize that certain certain roles don't shouldn't shouldn't from my perspective usually have a voice in the stand-up they can certainly listen and observe but they shouldn't be uh, interrupting or anything to that effect um, something I, I often see is uh, team members obviously being asked to, to speak rather than my preference which is I request someone to uh, to start us off and then I, I choose that person to nominate the next person to speak. And you can do that virtually very easily. Uh, and in person, if I was doing this, if we were all co-located, you can do that by having an object and throwing it to the next person. And you can only speak when someone's holding that object. Those would be a, a few a few tips for me. I think the, the issue can sometimes be you've got a, a hippo situation, a highest paid person in the room who's influencing subconsciously or otherwise the the outcome behind that session and that can cause a lot of dysfunction. Absolutely. Great idea. So thank you for sharing that, Chris. No problem. Tuesday is team day here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. But tomorrow we talk about something that goes beyond the work we do with the teams. We will talk about how to lead change and what our guests have learned from leading and participating in change programs during their career. See you tomorrow. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring.